You've heard of the Toyota 2000 GT, right? It was Toyota's flagship when it was released and showed the rest of the world that Japan was more than capable of building a sports car that could hang with the best of them. It helped shift public perception of cars from there and even paved the way for later cars like the Supra, the Lexus LS400, and even the Lexus LFA. But do you know the story behind the car? It was adored by the motoring press and shunned by the marketplace when it was released. But it showed its metal on the racetrack, shaped the histories of several companies, immortalized itself on the silver screen, and broke the seven-figure mark on the auction block. This is the history of the Toyota 2000 GT, Japan's first supercar. After Japan's defeat in World War II, the Allies enacted heavy restrictions on vehicle production. Automakers weren't outright banned from doing so, they were only permitted to build a limited number of trucks. These limitations were loosened in 1947, allowing for automakers to build around 300 cars per year. Although these were small cars with no more than 1,500 cubic centimeters of power, the automobile was still a luxury to the people of post-war Japan. A scooter or motorcycle, however, wasn't out of the realm of possibility. A few manufacturers noticed this and developed bikes on the side to complement their main business. One of these companies was Yamaha. Before the war, they gained reputation for their instruments and audio equipment. These items, like automobiles, were seen as comforts rather than necessities, and the factories that produced them were damaged in the war. As a result, the company decided to dedicate some resources to bring a motorcycle to market. Yamaha didn't commit much to this endeavor. The prototype workshop set to work on it was merely an offshoot of the research department, and the development team was made up of just seven people. They didn't design it from scratch either. The German-built DKW RT125 was used as a base. Even still, Bringing the bike to market still wasn't an easy task. The late nights and in-office dinners were worth it though. The first YA-1 prototype was completed in August of 1954, but the bike would have to be put through its paces before going on sale. It endured a grueling 10,000 km road test and participated in its share of races. Although this was their first foray in the motorcycle racing, Yamaha was able to find some success early on. The YA-1 was entered on the third Mount Fuji Ascent race and it dominated, winning outright and taking seven of the top 10 spots. The bike went into production of January of 1955. They were able to differentiate it from both the DKW and the competition with its unique color scheme. Most bikes at the time were painted black, but the chassis of the YA-1 was painted burgundy, while a fuel tank had a cream finish. This earned it the nickname Red Dragonfly. When it was time to design a successor, the YC-1, they went through a similar process. They referenced another DKW, and thanks to their experience with the last bike, they were able to get this one to production in February of 1956, or about a year after they began building the YA-1. They were going to do the same with their subsequent bikes, but there was a shift in mindset early on. The motor division went outside of its comfort zone and instead opted to design it from scratch. They went this route for a few reasons. Number one, the sort of bike they wanted to build didn't really exist in Japan at the time. Most of them were just tools designed to carry out a particular task. These would range from simply getting to point A to point B, or for more industrial purposes. Whatever the case, they surely weren't designed for leisure. The motor division envisioned a lightweight, agile machine that made driving pleasure a priority. Pretty much every area of the bike was optimized to meet this. The seat, the suspension, the position of the wheels, even the fuel tank were taken into consideration. Yamaha's third bike, the YD2, was the product of its thinking. Design also became more of a priority in the process. They had a car exterior in mind when designing their fourth bike, the YA2. The chassis exterior was smooth, and the side covers were recessed so they wouldn't protrude outward. This wasn't an exclusive to Yamaha. Design was slowly but surely getting prominence in Japan. Back in 1949, the United Kingdom complained that Japan was exporting textiles that misappropriated British designs. Other companies voiced similar concerns soon after. Japan needed to take action to avoid a diplomatic issue. The government revised its procedures in regards to products intended for export. They were now subject to more stringent registration and authorization standards. The company put more emphasis on this out of necessity, but some thought this wasn't enough. Their line of thinking was good design would be integral to the country's development. Recognizing and rewarding examples of good design would enable a faster, more natural progression of it as a whole. To do this, the Council of Design Promotion was founded inside the patent office. The panel, led by architect Junzo Sakakura, went out into the world looking for examples of good design. The YA2 actually won this award in 1957. The company felt they firmly established themselves in the domestic motorcycle market, and wanted to step out of their comfort zone once again. 
so they explored other types of products for export. Yamaha sent research department manager Shun Ono and Shikata Yashukawa out to investigate the American and European markets. The pair visited trade fairs, auto shows, and plenty of factories. The scale of the larger factories shocked them. The manpower, machinery, and resources required to mass produce cars was something that Yamaha themselves didn't have and couldn't possibly obtain. They also stopped by the facilities of Porsche, Pininfarina, and Mercedes-Benz. These factories weren't nearly as intimidating. Smaller teams put cars together by hand, and the downsized operations didn't stop their products from being known the world over. They were desirable machines that set themselves apart with their styling, craftsmanship, and engineering. This was something that Ono and Yasukawa believed that Yamaha could replicate. With that, it was decided that their next project would be a sports car. The company founded Yasukawa Research Lab in November of 1959. This was another development arm of the company that would focus solely on the car. There were only two employees when it was first established, but the team grew to about 20 strong by the time 1960 rolled around. They had a bit of experience designing motorcycles, but automobiles were an entirely different beast. Like the YA-1, the lab would reference a car similar to the one they set out to design themselves. They looked to the MGA Twin Cam because it was one of only a few cars available with a dual overhead cam engine. Essentially, these engines are more powerful and can rev higher than their single overhead cam and pushrod counterparts. They weren't all that common to begin with, and they were especially rare in Japan. They did, however, learn that an American officer stationed there just happened to have one. The lab got in contact with the officer and, by some miracle, were able to convince him to relinquish the car. The lab began by disassembling the twin cam and collecting information. They planned on using data gathered from this car and others to build a foundation, where they would add details of their own to make it distinctly Yamaha. The car, dubbed the YX30, would be a roadster powered by a four-cylinder dual overhead cam engine, very similar in concept to the twin cam, but Yamaha would differentiate it by making the engine out of aluminum. BMW's overhead cam V8 and the 507 used it in the block and head, but Yamaha would take it to another level by making the connecting rods out of the material. This would be the first all-aluminum engine if it ever reached production. A prototype would finish near the end of 1960, or about a year after work on the project began, and a 2x2 was completed in June of 1961. The sports car project wouldn't get much further than this, at least in its current form. Yasukawa read an article in a magazine detailing an engine that was made of sheet metal and assembled by brazing. This allowed for a light engine with a power and rate ratio of 1 to 1. This technique was used to create aircraft engines, but he felt the technology could be of use in automotive applications as well. They signed a lease agreement with Tice Engineering, but quickly ran into trouble. The brazing wasn't as precise as they would have liked it to be. This resulted in cracks in the combustion chambers, coolant links, and a myriad of other issues. To remedy these, Yamaha had to replace the damaged part with a cast one, removing much of the benefit of the Tice engines in the first place. The amount of money spent on the project and economic conditions forced Yamaha to halt development of the car and started the research department in February of 1962. The work they'd done over the past two and a half years would have been for nothing if Yasukawa hadn't made a special request of President Kawakami to salvage the progress they'd made in some way. Kawakami spoke to a few banks, and it was through these talks that Yamaha came out of contact with Nissan. Their head of technology, plus a few executives, paid them a visit to see what they had completed. They liked what Yamaha had and drew up a contract for a joint venture. Things started out small as Nissan felt them out as a business partner. Early products included a prototype convertible top and plans for a V8 engine. These went over well, so Nissan and Yamaha broke ground on something much more substantial. Nissan had been building sports cars since before the war. The Datsun Roadster was produced from 1932 to 1941. They had recently gotten back into the space, starting with the DC one for the 1953 model year and the Fair Lady line of Roadsters in 1959. The convertible market hadn't been kind to them. The first generation only lasted until 1960 and Nissan only managed to sell 20 examples. At the time they began speaking to Yamaha, they were producing the 1500, which did a little better sales-wise, but it was still having a rough go at it on the market. Nissan wanted to explore producing a closed-body sports car. The customer base would be larger, and it would be more suitable for export markets. The two companies set up a department between each other to service a link of communication. The research lab was more or less set back into place, as many of its former members were brought in. There was one notable addition to the team as well, Albert von Gortz. I spoke about Gortz's early life and career in a video I made on BMW, but how did the designer based in New York end up working for Nissan? He noticed their growing emphasis of design in Japan and sought out opportunities over there across the spectrum. Nissan brought him on in 1963, where he contributed to the 1964 Nissan Silvia. 
This car is worked on in parallel to the Yamaha joint venture, now called the A550X internally. The task of designing the car was assigned to four of Nissan's own designers, and Gortz took on more of a consultancy role. He assisted in refining their development process, which included the introduction of modern visualization techniques and the use of full-scale models. A prototype was finished a mere 10 months after work started. Nissan hoped to have something closer to production ready for the 1964 Tokyo Motor Show, but a few technical issues resulted in the car being postponed indefinitely. The aluminum engine was expensive and wasn't very reliable during testing. There were also a few electrical gremlins that couldn't be ironed out, like with the headlights for example. The car would have been considerably more expensive than Nissan had wanted had it gone on sale. They pulled the plug on the Venture in June of 1964 and opted to develop something in-house. After the joint venture with Nissan fell through, Kawakami went to Toyota to see if they had any interest in the project. A deal between the two companies was inked in January of 1965, and Toyota wasted little time to get into important projects. Five days after the venture was made official, Yamaha began assisting with Toyota's sports car project. Firstly, they wanted Yamaha to create dual cam variants of their existing engines. They planned on putting these in sports cars at Grand Tours. Toyota didn't have any cars that were truly in this vein, but they were developing one and wanted Yamaha to take on the bulk of prototype development. At that time, Toyota built its reputation on the compact Publica and Corona, the Sports 800, the Land Cruiser 4x4, the Stout Pickup, and the Full Size Crown. There isn't much cohesion in their lineup, and none of them, not even the Crown, were in the same ballpark as the car they had in mind. So the decision to create a luxury GT seems a bit out of the left field. What were they thinking? Well, Toyota won its class at the first Japanese Grand Prix back in 1963. The S40 Crown that took first place wasn't too far removed from what they had in the showroom. The display of engineering excellence made quite an impression on the 200,000 spectators at Suzuka. Toyota saw a significant bump in sales after the race and put one and two together. Those compact cars kept the lights on, but exciting displays like this lit a fire to them and drew people into the showroom. They wanted to follow up on this with something bigger, better, more aspirational. They had their sights focused abroad. Their victory at Suzuka drew up excitement in their home market, but most people in Europe and the Americas didn't even take the Japanese automotive industry seriously. They were perceived as a company that churned out cheap, disposable appliances that didn't inspire much confidence. The United States had a particularly rocky relationship with the brand. In 1957, Toyota saw the emergence of city cars there and began importing the Toyo Pet Crown. Much can be said about this experiment, but it can be summed up in one word, disastrous. The Crown was designed primarily to be a taxicab in Japan's densely packed metropolitan areas and struggled on America's wide open roads. This was also a little more than a decade after the war. It was still fresh in their minds, and the country was still an outright hostile place for Japanese products. It was destined to fail. They pulled it in 1961 and sent more than 200 unsold cars back to Okinawa. They carved in a niche in the market years later, though they still couldn't shed that first impression. Toyota needed to reinvent itself in people's minds if they wanted anything more from these markets. They needed a halo car, a melding of design, engineering, luxury, and performance that would take on the world's best on their own soil. Projects like this turn out best when they're made in the vision of a few people. Too many cooked muddled things, and it leads to an end result that isn't as focused. Passing information through many people would have also slowed development time significantly. Toyota is simply sick of their own to develop it. The team, led by race director Jiro Kawano, was handed a set of parameters and an aggressive deadline. Management envisioned a two-passenger coupe that was equal part sports coupe and opulent interstate bruiser. A formula used time and time again by European makes. They wanted someone to the show at the 1965 Tokyo Auto Show. The effect of the ticking clock had an effect on development from the very beginning. It took shape pretty early on, as seen by the sketch by designer Satoru Nozaki. These are just gestures and ideas, though we can already see some of the major elements come together. The pointy front bumper, long hood, and fastback rear deck appear on the side, while its distinctive wheel arches and wraparound windshield can be discerned from the top-down view. Aero testing was, well, there wasn't any. At least in the traditional sense, they planned on putting scale models through a wind tunnel, but this was scrapped due to time constraints. He had to consider how aerodynamic the car would be the moment pencil and paper met. Nozaki also had to improvise when it came time to make the model. He began by making a half-scale outline, referencing a few of his earlier sketches. He took a photograph of the drawing and blew it up to full size. From this, they made a wooden buck that was used to finalize the form and styling. There wasn't much of a conceptualization period, and the clay models were skipped over entirely. In a move similar to Yamaha, Kawano and his team disassembled and studied sports cars that were already proven, including the Jaguar E-Type, 
Lotus Elan, and Porsche 911. They didn't want to reinvent the wheel, only to make it better. When Yamaha's Kawakami approached them about the A550X, Toyota realized they could help tremendously with development. The 550 let Toyota know that their strengths were in prototyping and engine development. That design was scrapped. Toyota sent the 2000 GT team to the lab to continue work on the car. Being so detached from the corporate structure of both companies helped expedite the development process, but this also had its downsides. The parts they needed came from suppliers that were affiliated with Toyota. They had to contact these companies directly, and even then a few of them refused to fill the orders. In these cases, the team had to meet executives from these companies to plead their case in person. Everything that was out of the hands of the lab was caught up in the corporate structure of another company. They were going at their standard pace in the vacuum, but to the 2000 GT team, they may as well have been wadding around in quicksand. Components for the interior were being developed long after the structure layout of the car had been completed. Once they did finally come in, the team had to force everything inside. Despite all of this, they managed to get the first prototype finished in August of 1965. The assembly process could only get better from there, so this car was used as a testing machine while a second example was created for the show. The front end borrows the headlight style from Toyota's own Sports 800. Its driving lights are placed low in the car and sit behind a pexiglass housing. Additionally, the 2000 GT throws on a set of pop-up headlights up top. This wasn't always the plan. Going back to the sketches, we can see that the driving lights were intended to be the main units. These were too low for US regulations, so the team affixed the retractable lights to skirt the requirement. The front shoulders poke out slightly from the rest of the hood. They accentuate the wheels, but aren't so wide that they distract from the design. You might not see it at first, but the car can actually be broken up into three sections. We can isolate the hood and lay this area over the cabin. This leaves us with three defined sections. The aforementioned hood, the cabin area, and the rear deck. Let's start with the hood. It takes it nearly half the car. It's no start to the point and just barely gets over the wheel. From there, it's a straight shot of the windshield. Its rear view mirrors are set a bit past the front wheel, or about a third of the way to the cabin. Despite its long hood, the 2000 GT's windshield has a bit more rake than you might expect. It's able to pull the look off by extending well past the A-pillars and then wrapping around the dash. The A-pillars follow its lead, but the aggressive angle clashes with the B-pillars. This line is nearly a right angle. If we were to continue both lines past the boundaries of the car, then they'd intersect rather quickly. The same lines on a Jaguar E-Type of the same vintage aren't quite parallel, though there's a lot less drama than on the 2000 DT. Despite not going through any wind tunnel testing, calculations show that it had a coefficient of drag of just 0.28. The pillars are darkened, which focuses the attention of the brightwork line on the daylight opening. It goes from one end of the car to the other, creating a floating roof. This really opens the car up. The darkened pillars are taken out of the equation, meaning they were able to treat the DLO as a single continuous opening. There are doors on either side just behind the front wheels. The one on the right houses the battery, while the one on the left holds the air filter and windshield washer fluid. The character line borders the entire car. Let's start with the light assembly. It flows over the wheel and strains out under the cabin. It becomes less defined here, but it flares out right after passing the door. This haunts wide into the car and gives a tall and narrow cabin in place to rest. Back here, the line defines the hatch and wraps around to do it all over again. The rear end is a bit asymmetrical despite Yamaha's best efforts. The antenna is on the right haunch, and the gas cap is on the left. The cap is larger and sits closer to the deck, resulting in a visual weight pulling left. In an effort to balance everything out, Yamaha placed a rather large Toyota 2000 GT word mark offset to the right. It is an exactly and aesthetically pleasing solution, though it did at least confirm the onlookers that they were, indeed, laying eyes on a Toyota. Besides, they didn't have anywhere else to place it. The rear end has its hands full with the tail lights, bumpers, license plate, and exhaust tips. This area of the car doesn't integrate some features, as well as the front. Up there, the bumpers hide between the fog lights and are pushed to the very edges of the body. The ones back here, however, sit at the center and jut out well past the bodywork. Inside, the steering wheel, shift lever, and dashboard were all made from the same high quality rosewood that Yamaha used for their pianos. The hood and trunklet were made from fiberglass, while the rest of the body was made from aluminum. Yamaha hired highly skilled motor workers at a great cost to help assemble them. The body sat on top of a steel backbone frame, a setup similar to the Lotus Elan. It was powered by the same engine from the Crown 6, a 2 liter inline 6, though the dual overhead conversion bumped the numbers up to 150 horsepower and 129 pound feet of torque. They originally wanted to use the V8 from the Crown 8, but a dual cam version of that would have been heavier taller, 
and taking up more space under the hood. Other mechanical features include a four-wheel independent suspension and a limited slip differential. Toyota invited a few publications to Toyota City to test the prototype. Car Magazine felt it would be a worthy addition to the GT class. They praised its interior finish and smooth engine. Steering took some getting used to though. Testers found themselves over controlling the car because it was so precise. Pointed in a direction, and the car would follow without delay. They settled in quickly enough and raved about that as well. He ended the piece by saying, It seems to me that it will be one of the best value for money sports cars in the world when it goes into production later this year. They predicted the starting price was between 1,800 and 2,000 pounds. News of the car made waves the world over. Albert R. Broccoli, a producer for the James Bond movies, fell in love the moment he laid eyes on it. The fifth entry in the franchise, You Only Live Twice, was to take place in Japan. He felt the car would make a worthy follow-up to the legendary Ashton Martin DB5 from earlier films. He got in touch with Toyota to see if they could work something out. 007, colloquially known as Zero Zero in Japan, was incredibly popular there, and that's to say nothing of the international notoriety of the franchise. Toyota, believing they could drum up some more hype for their sports coupe, was more than happy to help out. They sent two cars out of the set, a left-hand drive car and a right-hand drive car. The production crew immediately ran into the problems. Six-foot-two Sean Connery, star of the show, couldn't fit into the car. The crew also had a difficult time getting interior shots of the car. They improvised by installing a center front of the left-hand drive model, but it wasn't enough. It dawned on them that this was a job for Toyota. They didn't consider an open-top version when developing it, but feared it wouldn't be too much of an expensive if it was just for the film. Toyota first tried a target version out, though Connery's hat stuck out far past the windshield and rear deck. Two more cars were sent to a service center in Tsunashima, where workers spent two weeks tirelessly working to convert them into full-on convertibles. The front end up to the windshield was kept intact, but the rear end had to be completely redone, save for the lights and bumpers. After the work, the cars were without side windows or a top. Fake tonneau covers were affixed to their boots to complete the look. Co-star Akinko Wakabayashi couldn't drive, so Toyota test drivers Hiroshi Fushida and Tomohiko Tsutsumi operated the pedals and gears. The crew was finally able to show the interior off. It had a suite of Sony electronics, including a television set with a VCR and a glove box, camera to behind a license plate, a two-way radio, a voice-controlled tape recorder, and a hi-fi receiver. One of the cars mysteriously vanished after filming. It's speculated that it was meant to be destroyed, but was actually hidden away by the company hired to crush it, and so to the highest bidder. The other was used to promote the film for a while, most notably in Geneva in 1967. Afterward, it was painted blue, then gray, then became the Fuji Speedway course car, then vanished before it reappeared in Hawaii in 1977. To read about this example, meticulously restored it and placed it in their museum, where it remains today. Bond car collector Peter Nelson wanted to buy it from them, but they wouldn't sell it for any amount of money. Instead of calling it quits, he decided to make his own. He started work in 1995, using a production 2000 GT as a base. He wanted to be as true to the original as possible, so he got into contact with Eon Productions, the company that produces James Bond films, to ensure its accuracy. Eon Productions actually sent him the original control panel from the film car. The replica was on display at his Cars of the Stars Motor Museum until its closure in 2011. Most of the cars were purchased by Michael Deezer and relocated to the Miami Motor Museum. The second car reappeared sometime later and was purchased by Japanese car collector Takashi Morori. It's currently on loan to the Peterson Automotive Museum. And what about the original coupes? They weren't used in the movie or for promotional purposes. They weren't sent back to Toyota. Instead, they were kept in the warehouses of Eon Productions. Production designer Sidney Kane bought the right-hand drive car and registered it in July of 1968. It eventually fell into the hand of H.R. Owen, a UK-based chain of sports car dealers. Viscount Charles Random of Norfolk laid eyes on it in the showroom. Neither he nor the dealer had any idea of the car's history. The lot also dealt Bentleys and Ferraris and wanted to clear that space up for something from a more prestigious make. Random simply wanted something fun to drive. He was able to walk away with it for a paltry 1,700 pounds. He remained oblivious to its origins until he had it serviced for an overheating issue. Random owned the car for 21 years. It was painstakingly cared for and even participated in the Pirelli Classic Marathon in 1989, where Ovi Anderson drove from London to Cortina, Italy. It became too much of a burden. He simply couldn't keep up with the costs associated with it, so the car was sold to a buyer outside of the UK for £35,000. The left-hand drive car was purchased by William Atwell, 
who turned around and sold it to the collector Mel Farrar. He drove the wheels off of it in his nine years of ownership, taking it out once for a whopping 12 miles. The car was warmly received at the show, and people were prepared to drop money on it, but it was still a little ways out from production. It needed to be tested, though neither company had the facilities to put the car through its paces. Yamaha and Toyota turned to what they knew best, racing. The car first entered the third Japanese Grand Prix in May of 1966, where it finished third. Although they didn't come out on top, it was an impressive showing considering it was the first race and also because it finished behind two Prince R380s. It found its first victory in the following race, earning a 1-2 finish at Suzuka. The 2000 GT would go on to win the Fuji 24-hour endurance race in 1967. Toyota pushed the car to its absolute limits at the Yatabe test track. This was a 5.5 km long circuit founded by the Japanese Automotive Research Institute to allow automakers to perform high-speed tests that were impossible elsewhere in the country. It took 17 months and $5 million to build, but it was finally open on September 17, 1964. Toyota was there to set endurance records. The official record run was on October 1, 1966, and Toyota would have three practice tests on the track before the official one. The first two runs ended prematurely after 6 and 25 hours, respectively, due to engine failure. The oil pump design was modified, but they ran into yet another issue before their final trial run. The sky had completely opened up, drenching the track and making for unfavorable racing additions. The team runs the car anyways. It traveled about 10,000 kilometers before being flooded. The class needed to be replaced, but they didn't have any on hand, though they did eventually get one right before the test. Five drivers, each between 19 and 34, took turns driving the car for two and a half hour intervals for 72 hours. The weather, while not as bad as before, still wasn't great. The car managed to get through the trail despite the less than optimal conditions, maintaining an engine speed of 7200 RPM for the full 72 hours and reaching speeds of up to 210 km per hour. It set a total of 13 new records, which you can learn a bit more about in the pinned comment titled notes. Toyota also wanted to build an international racing pedigree. They had their eyes set on the SCCA C-Class. This was a series for imported cars to show out. It saw the likes of Alfa Romeo, Lotus, and Triumph, but the class was dominated by Porsche. The 2000 GT and 911 would be going head-to-head -head on the marketplace, so it made sense for both to duke it on the racetrack to see which one would reign supreme. Peter Berg was originally slated to get the car fitted for the series, but Carol Shelby made a late push for the contract by paying a visit to Mr. Toyota's personal residence. Toyota sent three cars out of the Shelby team midway through the 1967 season. One of them carried the serial number 10001, meaning it was the very first production car off the line. The cars were put to their paces by Ronnie Bucknam and Jared Titus at Willow Springs Raceway. They fitted the car's new roll bars, installed fully customizable suspension systems, and replaced the stock tires with special order Goodyear racing slicks that helped reduce the car's ride height from 6 inches to 2.5 inches. They praised the handling, chassis, and brakes, though the team had a bit of trouble getting power out of the engine. They'd often fail during testing. Even after these issues were sorted, the SCCA forced them to replace the carburetor they were running, costing them as much as 10 horsepower. The cars were driven by Scooter Patrick and Davey Johnson, who finished third and fourth in championship points, respectively. First and second were taken by, you guessed it, Porsche. By most metrics, the first season was a success. It got through numerous mechanical hiccups and SCCA regulations to be the second best car in the class. This was a great foundation for the team to build upon for the next season, or at least it would have been if Toyota hadn't pulled the plug on the racing endeavors. They put half a million dollars toward the racing, and they weren't getting the return they would have liked. This was reflecting on what they felt was a disappointing end of the season, as well as in their sales in the US, which we'll get to a bit later. The car made his much anticipated debut in May of 1967. The design carried over to production for the most part, though there were a few changes. The retractable headlight housing to replace with rose petal shaped ones. Toyota also switched out the wire wheels for ladder Mac rims. The door handles on the prototype were lifted from the crown. The production cars, however, got their own set of thin, chrome-plated units. The cars were hand-built by Yamaha. It was a struggle to start. They built bikes for a decade or so, but building with a 2000 GT had many more steps and was more involved. If that wasn't enough, they had to conform to Toyota's stringent quality standards. There were a few issues early on, like panel gaps and water leaks, but they were able to tighten everything up before too long. Road & Track Magazine got their hands on the first production car to reach American soil and posted the glowing review in June of 1967. They raved about its steering, suspension, and chassis, saying, when it comes to ride and handling, nobody in his right mind would need or want more than a road vehicle than the 2000 GT has to offer. 
Carter Republic their protest in the April 1968 issue and had mostly good things to say about it. They praised the attention to detail and noted that while the car was expensive, it wasn't as bad of a prospect as it initially seemed. Cars in that class nickel and dime for pretty much everything, but the 2000 GT came standard with everything, including an LSD and heated rear window. Performance left a bit to be desired, as the magazine critiqued the clunky transmission and poor throttle response. Ride quality was another plus. It managed to feel sporty without being overly harsh like a few of its competitors. And the steering was nice and snappy. A few magazines poked fun of the owner's manual. The following line was of particular interest to them. To loosen the hub nuts, install the hub nut wrench with the hub nut, and then drive with the hub nut wrench with the hammer and the tool kit, carefully damaging the body and disc wheel. Car and driver echoed the sentiments of other publications about the interior, though they did find a few quirks in there as well. The radio, for example, is the exact same for both left-hand drive and right-hand drive models, meeting the valley knobs on the right and the seek knobs on the left. Press the ladder down and you send the car through an auto-seek mode, where to go from station to station at 10-second intervals to see whether or not you want to stay on them. Toyota and Yamaha had other markets in mind when designing the car, but the Zerta still found the interior ergonomics to be compromised for those over 6 feet tall. There wasn't much luggage space and visibility was outright horrible from certain angles. Car driver went as far as to say, the driver feels a need to turn on the scouting card before attempting a lane change. In the end, they felt the 2000 GT was a compelling choice in the segment, despite the flaws, and would appeal to the right buyer. An update in 1969 brought in a number of changes. Up front, the driving light area got smaller and the side indicators grew. It also got a softer suspension and an updated interior. A handful of these cars also got automatic transmissions and air conditioning. These models, internally designated as MF-12s, were designed with the American market fully in mind, as they all left the factory with their steering wheels on the left side. They also had larger, less powerful 2.3-liter single overhead cam engines that came from the Crown line. Although Toyota wasn't making any money on the cars, they still wanted to eventually build a thousand of them a month. There were a few barriers to this, the largest of which being its price. When it went on sale in the US, the 2000 GT cost around $6,800, and the price skyrocketed to $7,200 later on. Toyota knew this was an issue, and began development on a lower spec version. The car would share the body with the 2000 GT, and Kanto Bodyworks was meant to shoulder some of the production. This didn't go anywhere. It would have cost a significant amount of money to retool the factory, and Toyota didn't believe they'd be able to hit their sales targets. Sticker Shock was the main factor in the car's downfall though it also had to overcome the stigma that Japanese products garnered in the years following the war. Animosity toward the country lingered long after, and there was also the issue of imitation products touched upon earlier. The price might not have been a match for the brand, though it was still a quality product that was on par with the competition. It didn't matter. Toyota wasn't taken seriously in a segment that included Porsche, Maserati, Aston Martin, and Jaguar. It never got a fair shake. Production of the car ended in October of 1970, 351 cars were built over 4 years, 233 MF-10s, 109 MF-10Ls, and 9 MF-12s. 337 were regular cars where the other 17 were made for racing or other purposes. 150 of them were exported out of the country, and 62 of these were left-hand drive models that were shipped to the US. There may very well be at least one fear example out there. On June 8, 2014, a man in Tomayo Prefecture drove his 2000 GT to Gakohama to celebrate his birthday. He approached a 100-foot beech tree in a historic part of the city. It fell over the exact moment he passed under it. The car got absolutely mangled, though amazingly the man was only treated for minor injuries. Authorities warned the town some time ago that it could be a safety hazard. The trunk was rotted out, and it hung over the road. They only had the power to caution them, though. The tree was located in a historic preservation site and couldn't be cut down. In April of 2016, the driver sought 39 million yen in damages on the basis that the incident could have been avoided if the precursor hadn't neglected to maintain the highway. The case went back and forth until they settled it out of court for 17 million in March of 2018. He made an effort to get it repaired, though I'm not absolutely certain of his fate. The owner reportedly asked Toyota for an estimate, and they said it would cost 100 million yen to restore it to its former glory. It was assumed that it would be a parts car, but there were photos of it being towed into a body shop. That's where their trail goes cold. Today their site has three listed for sale, but I can't say for sure if it's any of those. If anyone has any additional information on this, then feel free to leave a comment down below. The 2000 GT may have been a flop sales-wise, but its legacy lives on in more ways than one. It was instrumental in changing the perception of Japanese cars. It didn't happen overnight. 
Toyota went years before releasing a car in the same vein. It did break away at the wall, however. Cars released in later years like the Datsun 240Z and Mazda RX-7 further chipped away. The 2000 GT was also the first of several collaborations between Toyota and Yamaha. Both companies would get together soon after finishing development of the car and start working on the Toyota 7 race car, which entered competition in 1968. Yamaha also helped design several of their engines, including the 3S GE inline 4, which first appeared in the 1985 Celica. No doubt their finest work in this regard was the 4-liter V10 engine from the Lexus LFA, considered one of the greatest engines ever designed. Values of the car have been historically lower than some of its contemporaries, hovering around the $100,000 range. The list has changed drastically in the past decade or so. In May of 2006, a car sold for $210,000 in Australia. In July, another one sold for $216,000 at Le Mans. Prices skyrocketed from here. Things finally boil over in 2013, where one sold for a whopping $1.15 million. It was the most expensive Asian car ever sold at auction at the time of sale. It was the perfect storm. The car is one of the 62 left-hand drive examples that were exported to the US. It also underwent a significant restoration process that brought it closer to its original state. Another car sold for just over $1 million a year later in Monterey. This seemed to be the tipping point in the 2000 GT market. One sold for $880,000 in 2015. At least two others were sold in 2016. The first went for $797,000 at Amelia Island, and the second was auctioned off on Bring a Trailer for a mere $560,000. These days, you can expect to buy a decent one for around this price. And that's the story of the Toyota 2000 GT, a car that went mostly unappreciated in its time, but today has become an icon in the motoring world. Hopefully, the fire will burn even brighter for generations to come.